went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first such registration. It was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds then returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. discern this Christmas what not only is my favorite Christmas song, in fact, it's not my favorite Christmas song. To be totally honest, I have discerned what is my favorite Christmas line from a Christmas song. The song itself, to make it more confusing for you, is not my favorite Christmas song. But the line is my favorite Christmas song line. Are you with me? Okay. Sorry about that. It's A Little Town of Bethlehem, which is not my favorite Christmas song. It's a fine song, nothing wrong with the song in and of itself, just not my favorite. But my favorite line is, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And the reason that's my favorite line from a Christmas song is because it includes both our hopes and our fears. Sometimes during this season we focus on hope and, and on joy and on a sense of giddiness about what's coming tomorrow morning and people tend to bounce up and down a little bit on this day especially, which seems to lengthen out as we wait for what's coming. It's all good, it's all happy, it's all hope, joy, wonderful, wonderfulness. But if we're honest with ourselves, this holy day encompasses so much more than that. Because a lot of us don't have a lot to celebrate this holiday. A lot of us have some fear right about now. Some uncertainty about the future. A lot of us may be facing a holiday this year for the first time without a loved one with whom we've celebrated holidays for years and years. And this year they are absent, and so there's pain there. Some of us have loved ones who even now are in hospital rooms, wondering what's going to happen in the next few hours or days. 
some of us are worried and anxious and afraid with the hopes and fears of all the years are met here tonight. The birth of Jesus Christ encompasses all of that. And we come to the stable with all of that, with our lives in all of their beauty and wonder and splendor and ugliness and brokenness and pain. All of it tonight is met, comes together, converges in this birth, the birth of Jesus Christ. It reminds me of a, a cliché that I hear quite often. It's a religious cliché. It's a specifically Christian cliché. One of my hobbies, one of my sidelines, if you will, is debunking Christian clichés. <laughs> you know, they're the things that appear on, on bumper stickers or, or t-shirts, sometimes on billboards. You know, one of them that says, don't make me come down there, God. Have you seen that one? Okay, what are... Is not that the very thing that we long for? I mean, is that not what we're hoping for? Aren't we hoping that God come? I mean, isn't that what we want? So, I'm, I, it, join me, please, in debunking Christian cliches. The one, the one that that reminds me of, that this night reminds me of, is this one. It, it, it is said, I, I gotta, before I say the, what the cliche is, i got to say that when it is uttered, when it is offered, the intention is to be helpful. The intention is to be helpful. But it's not always the most helpful thing to say. Have you ever heard this or maybe said this? I know I have. God answers every prayer, but sometimes the answer is no. Have you heard that one? Heard that one? Well, I've said that one before, and I, I will say it no longer. I, I, I can't say that prayer anymore. Think about the theology involved there. Think about who we're saying God is if we say that cliché. God sits up in the answering prayer room somewhere and receives prayers. And one of them might be, please heal mom so that she gets better. And another one might be, please heal mom so that she gets better. And God, what are we saying? God says yes to this one and no to that one, just sort of arbitrarily? God says no to some prayers. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. If that makes me a heretic of some kind, I'm guilty. But I can't believe that God is sitting there sort of willy-nilly, randomly answering some prayers yes and some prayers no. I think that God's answer to every single prayer is yes. Unequivocally, with no doubt, God answers every prayer with a yes. It's just that God listens to the prayers that we truly need to be praying which aren't always the prayers that we're saying out loud. You hear that? God answers yes to every single one of the prayers that we truly need to be praying. But the prayers that we truly need to be praying aren't always the ones that come to mind and we say out loud. Does not Romans 8 say that we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf with sighs that are too deep for words. The prayers that are our prayers that we need to pray, God hears and answers with an unequivocal yes. Second Corinthians says that with Christ there is no yes and no, but in Christ there is only yes when it is according to God's desires. When it is according to God's will, every prayer that we pray can we be, at its core, thy will be done. And so we come to a season where we expect hope and, and joy and, and peace and love, and, and some of us aren't there and, and also bring fear and doubt and skepticism and brokenness and pain and grief and, and all of that messiness of our life, and we go, here we are. On the holiest night of all Christmas Eve, surely everything will be fine now. Surely everything will be okay. God, hear our prayers. I mean, haven't we been spending this entire Advent season listening to the voices of the prophet who say, in the presence of God, the world will be changed. 
The mountains will crumble. The valleys will be exalted. Mighty oak trees of righteousness will, will come from these tiny little acorns. Everything will be changed. The world will be a safe, just, loving place. In the power of God's presence, these things will come to be. It's what we're hoping for. It's what we're longing for. But you know what? We're going to wake up on Monday morning. And there's going to be someone who's hungry in Springfield, Missouri. There's going to be a kid who has gotten beaten up by a relative. There's going to be someone who had to spend last night on the street. But that's just here. What happens? God, well, God answers every prayer, just that some of them are no. Come on. Give me a break. What happened? How is it that we can say this divine, powerful presence who's capable of changing the world just says no to some people and yes to others? Somewhere in this story, somewhere in this convergence of hope and and joy and love and peace, somewhere in this crashing together of the divine power of God and the human brokenness of this world, somewhere in that boundary, somewhere in this incarnation lies the answer. And that answer is yes. Now we know the answer is yes. And so maybe our job as followers of Jesus Christ is to spend a little more time trying to figure out what the question is. Love? Yes. Pain? The answer is yes. Hope? The answer is yes. Fear? The answer is yes. Doubt? The answer is yes. Certainty? The answer is yes. Whatever you got, Whatever you bring to this stable, to this manger, to this incarnation, to this baby, whatever you bring, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. On this holy night, we celebrate a holy sacrament. A sacrament that encompasses all that we are. We do not worship a God who is content to remain distant and aloof sitting upstairs in the, in the prayer-answering room of heaven, pressing the yes button for some and the no button for others. Whatever we have, wherever we are, wherever we come from, and whatever we bring God's answer to all of us is yes. Come and live and grow and share on this holy night. As Jesus is born, we come, we remember, we live. And the answer is yes. Please pray. We thank you for this holy story, Almighty God, in which every one of your promises is a yes. Somewhere in the midst of this story, somewhere in the midst of this birth, you have said yes to who we are. Affirmed us, lifted us up, given us life, and the promise of an unimaginable, everlasting life with you. And we give you thanks. And we come. We come to you to hear you say yes to us, to receive your grace, to receive your love. And God, we are not worthy. We are not worthy to come and even gather up the crumbs that fall from this table. But in your abundance, you have given us unimaginable gifts. We confess to you that we do fall short. We place limits on ourselves and on others. We, we don't live the lives that you desire. And still, your answer is yes. And so we come. 
and kneel before you to receive your yes, to receive your grace, to receive your love. We remember that the, the baby who was born tonight grew to teach and to share and to love and, and to give his life so that we could live. And we remember how he gathered around the table similar to this and, and took a loaf of bread and gave thanks to you, breaking the bread and sharing it with his disciples, saying, take this and eat. For this is my body. It is for you. And after they had eaten, he took a cup. <coughs> he gave thanks to you and shared it with them, saying, Drink from this cup, all of you. This is my blood. It's for you. Every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. And so in this moment, God, we do remember. We remember that you came to earth and took on flesh and blood for our sake. We remember that you taught us to love one another as you love us. We remember that you gave that holy life for us so that we might live the life that you desire. And in this moment of remembering, we anticipate. We anticipate the moment when all of your children are free to gather together around the table and feast at the heavenly banquet with you. Pour out your spirit upon us, Almighty God. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts of bread and juice and make them be for us. The flesh and blood, incarnate presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, in our midst. <coughs> By your Spirit, make us one with you. Make us one with each other. Make us one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ is born again. And we all gather together and share in the holy yes of your love. Through Christ with Christ, and in the unity and power of your Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and always. Amen.